Our next speaker is David Jansen. He's a pastor of discipleship. Is that your title? <coughs> pastor of equipping in Sandy, Utah, is that where it is? Uh, near Salt Lake City, a Bible church there. And uh, he does a great job. Last year he was our highest rated speaker. He's speaking on a terrific passage, one that many people think of as a problem passage. It's only a problem if your theology is messed up. <laughs> it's, it's a great passage. Don't, haven't we all heard the expression, the truth shall set you free? Well, that comes from this passage. And it's a powerful passage. And he's got a powerful message. So let's give David a hand. You have heard the phrase many times in many places, and the question gets to be, what is it talking about it and what does it apply to? Uh, according to this article, it has to do with the orcas being released into freedom. The truth shall set them free. Or it might be a legal situation where in a courtroom, the concern is truth with uh, Jim Carrey. Here's what he has to say with excitement. He was excited about the answer, what can we say? The truth shall set you free, is it about the finale recap of the TV series Castle? Is that what this is about? Or is it about uh, the book and, or the movie, uh, The Help? The truth shall set you free, that might be getting a little closer. This one's kind of interesting on uh, Amazon, The Truth Shall Set You Free. This is about a wife that wrote about discovering that her husband uh, was a homosexual. That's what this book is about. The truth shall set you free. So it shows up quite a few places, but Jesus is the one that said it. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And we want to take a look at what he says about this, because there's a number of questions. Who is he talking to? Uh, how is a person made free? What are you made free from? And so we want to take a look at the passage and and see what he has to say. It's a great passage. So if you're not there yet, go to John 8, 30 to 32. We want to take a look at this passage, John 8, 30 to 32. This takes place at the temple. In chapter 8, verse 1, he is on the Mount of Olives. Verse 2, he comes down, and he is at the temple. And this is where they bring the woman caught in adultery, and he interacts with those people. And then in verse 12, he begins talking about who he is. And he's inside the temple in the women's courtyard, referred to as the treasury. It says that specifically in, in 820. And that's where he's having this conversation. So he's having this conversation with, with Jews. That's who he's having the conversation with. Um, the chapter breaks down with him talking to the crowd for the first part of the chapter, 2 through 29. That's where the account of the uh, woman caught in adultery is located. Plus, he says, I'm the, uh, I am the light of the world. And he begins talking about himself. But at verse 30, it says that there were many who believed in him. And he turns to that group, whoever they are, and he says one sentence to them. One sentence. And that's a sentence we're going to take a look at. So there was this crowd, just like there's a group of you, and he was speaking, and we're not sure how he knows this or how he identified it, but within that group, many, not just some, many recognized that he was the Messiah and acknowledged him as such. And he had a statement to say to them, to these new believers. He had something to say to them. One sentence. Now, at verse 33, it starts with they in the New American Standard, and it goes back to the antagonists. And this is where the discussion argument takes place because as you read the rest of this chapter, you find uh, specifically, Jesus says in verse 45, they are not believers. They do not believe in him. And so 
If that's the same group as 30 through 32, then those are not believers either. They're professing believers. They're temporary believers. They're not authentic believers, that sort of concept. And so that's where most of the discussion centers is whether 30 through 32 are real believers or not. Now, this has been addressed. Bob addressed it in the Grace and Focus, The Truth Shall Set You Free. That is the uh, shorter version. In 2003, John Nemo addressed it as a plenary session, free at last. At his website, you can get the 21-page paper that deals with that. That would be the longer version of handling this issue. But both of these men and others have addressed this sufficiently and well. The text says they're believers. So I am taking it uh, from that perspective. Notice the terminology in verse 30. Many came to believe in him. And, of course, we've been focusing on this terminology this week, believe in him. And then in 31, very parallel uh, statement, he talks to those who had believed him. And notice that the, the distinction is referring to the same group of people and making an affirmation about them. In the first case, they believed in Jesus. That's the concept of believing in the person of Jesus. They recognized he was the Messiah. The second statement is they believed him as in what he said. And the two, are, there's not a dichotomy between the two. I think it's a restatement. It refers to Jesus and what he says. And both statements simply affirm. They believed in Jesus and they believed what he said because he was describing himself as the light of the world and the Messiah, and they believed it. And so we have these great statements just back to back, and I don't think we should dice them as if they're totally different things, because it's simply saying the same thing with a different emphasis. So Jesus is talking to believers, and they're in fact new believers. And here's a question I was wondering about or thinking about or reflecting upon as I looked at this. Jesus is talking to these group of men, probably, but maybe they're, and, and they came to believe that he was the Messiah. So he says one sentence to these new believers. Now, if you had a new believer that had just trusted in Christ and you were going to give them one sentence, what would your sentence be? What would be so important that they needed to know right now, now that they've trusted in Christ, what's the thing they need to know? What's your sentence? I don't have a sentence. I can think of a few miscellaneous ones, and there may not be one right answer, but Jesus gives them one sentence of discipleship instruction before he returns arguing with the rest of them. Okay? That's the sentence we want to look at because I would suggest that that's important. It's two believers. And in, uh, in verse 31, the last half, and 32, he says, if you continue in my word, two things are true. Number one, you are truly disciples of mine, and the truth will make you free. Those two things happen, but they're conditional. The if, if is a third class Greek conditional statement, it may or may not be true. So recognize these folks are believers, but these believers maybe will continue. This is the word abide. New King James says, if you abide in my word. The believers may abide, but the believers may not. It's the same situation today. We have believers that abide and believers that do not abide. That's the choice. It can go either way. Jesus made it clear. But he goes on to make the case to say, hey, if you will, let me tell you the advantages of this deal. Two things, you're truly going to be my disciple. And second of all, the truth will make you free. And we'll talk about what those things are. So the if is key in it. And I made it large in terms of my slide. And the condition is if you continue or abide in my word. Now that's the main phrase. I'm going to come back to that. Let me step through the rest of this sentence, this single sentence that Jesus said to these new believers. He says, if you will abide in my word, you are truly disciples of mine. Now, the word disciple shows up a variety of places, but only Matthew through Acts. And it is referring to sometimes the 12 or people that are followers. The basic idea is that of a learner or a follower. 
a learner or a follower. And I like what J. Dwight Pentecost has done in terms of describing a, a spectrum of disciples. You have some that are curious in John 6, uh, 60 to 66, where they are interested in Jesus and his miracles and what he has to say, and they want to listen to him. We would call them seekers today. These are the seekers. But, they, but see, they have a learning aspect because they want to know. They want to know. Uh, then there's ones that are convinced they believe in Jesus, and then those that are committed. And so the concept would be the curious uh, refer to unbelievers, the committed refer to believers, and not, excuse me, the convinced refer to believers, the committed refer to abiding believers. Now within that committed um, category, there would be a whole spectrum, but these are ones that are abiding. And so in this verse, he says, you are truly disciples of mine. And that's why the truly helps us pick up. We're not just talking curious. It just told us that they believed. So if they abide, they meet that condition as true disciples or in Pentecost terminology, the committed disciple. And that's where they end up if they will meet the condition. Then we have the statement, the truth will make you free. And it is a very broad statement, and as I pointed out, applied to all kinds of things. So to understand what that's referring to, let's take a look at the, at the next couple passages here. In verse 33, they answered him, and this is the crowd that's antagonistic to Jesus, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been enslaved. So they're still on the same subject. They heard Jesus say this. We have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say, you will be free, and that's what he said, that it will, the truth will make you free. And so Jesus answers them, they're still on the subject. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So there's the word slave, and they are slaves to sin. Now realize the context, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Earlier in chapter 8, they had brought the woman caught in adultery, and Jesus had interacted with, with that situation, and he said that those who were without what could throw the first stone? Sin. And what happened to the crowd? <laughs> okay? He, they, he just made the sin point in contrast to, uh, w with the religious leaders, with a woman that had committed adultery, that they were in the category, that same category. And he said, if you commit sin, that person is a slave to sin. And so this is, they're trying to get out of this, and Jesus is making sure they're not going to get out of this. And he goes on and he uses an illustration, the slave who doesn't have freedom does not remain in the house forever. The son who does have freedom does remain forever. That word son is not referring to Jesus, just the contrast in a household between a slave and a, uh, a son and the rights that are associated with each one of those. When I was a, a, an engineer, I worked at Tyndall Air Force Base on these particular jets, a QF-100 full-scale drone, and I was fresh out of college, and at that point, I looked very young. I could have passed for 16 without a lot of difficulty, but I was at this Air Force base in Panama City, Florida, and I was responsible for doing testing at this hangar. So I would go out, I'd go out to the hangar, and I'd I, I needed the jet to do some things, and I'd go out and I'd talk to this mechanic, and I'd say, okay, now this mechanic is like this guy that looks like a gorilla, and he's, you know, he was in Vietnam, and his knuckles drag, and, and he's humongous, and, and, and I say, you know, I need you to put that jet up on hydraulics, I need full electrical, I'm gonna do some testing on this with the flight control systems and so forth. So the first time I walk out there to do that, he turns to me, he says, you can go get your own blank blankety airplane and do whatever blank blankety blank you want to do with it. I'm not getting you any blank blankety airplane. I'm not doing a blank blankety thing for you. 
I mean, I'm looking up at this guy, and he's just, just like swearing at me. So I'm like, well, I, I still need the airplane. <laughs> then I walk back in my office, and I'm going, I don't know what's going to happen next. Well, I go back out there, and he's got it up, and we've got full electrical, and I can do my testing. Now, what I learned over time with this guy is he, he was a slave to sin in the sense of his language. He could not say a sentence without swearing. I never heard one. And, and he just seemed to enjoy this routine. Every time I'd go out and ask him for something, he'd just cuss me out, and then he'd go do it. I was over him in terms of what we needed done. But it was like, and so, I mean, this guy was a, a slave to us. And now, it actually turned out that he was a very nice guy, except for his language. But we are slaves to these things, and, and I use him as an illustration just because what's always true is we can always see it in other people way easier than we see it in ourselves. So I'll illustrate with him, in other words. Um, but a slave to sin, a slave to sin, and he was. Um, and then it goes on, and Jesus, once again, is addressing these unbelievers that are antagonistic to him. In 35 and 36, he, I've already read uh, 35, that concerning the son or the slave, one's free and one's not. In 36, he says, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. You will be free indeed. And so, whoever is a slave to sin. So he's talking about this issue of slavery to sin and getting free from that. And here he's saying to these people, he's just told the new believers that if they abide in, he says, if you abide in my word, that's how you're going to experience freedom. But he's, he's making the issue himself as he's dealing with these unbelievers that are antagonistic to him. They've got a Jesus issue. They've got to deal with him. The path to freedom is connected to Jesus. They have to deal with him first, and so far they're rejecting him. And so he makes that the focus, and he says, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. That's what he says to them. So the concept is people struggling with sin and wanting freedom. People struggling with sin and wanting freedom. Now let me remind you, who was Jesus talking to back in 31? Believers or unbelievers? Believers. He's dealing with believers who are struggling with sin. Okay? That's us, folks. That's us. Believers struggling with sin. And he's giving an answer to these new believers in terms of what they need to know to deal with this. And he says they need to abide in, in his word. I want to play a video clip here uh, to try capture the struggle and, uh, that's related to sin. The video is not giving the answer. Our text gives the answer. Uh, but it pictures, and the pun's intended, uh, what's happening with the struggle with sin. So here we go.
Do you feel the slavery? Do you feel the uh, desire and joy for the freedom from that? That's what I want you to see. It doesn't give an answer. Taking a picture doesn't solve it. Uh, but that's what we will deal with um, at various times. And so I appreciated how they captured that. Let's take a look at the condition. I told you I'd come back to this. Um, here's the condition. If you continue in my word, if you abide in my word, um, that's the condition. So we need to understand what the continue is or the abide is about, and that's what I want to uh, address here next. In the New American Standard, when the word meno is translated, it's translated 51 times as uh, abide, another 34 times as stay, remain, excuse me, and then 24 times as stay, and then another nine times as miscellaneous. And in this passage, our translation is the word continue, so it's actually one of the miscellaneous ones. But I want you, you know, abide is kind of like this, you know, religious word, like bless, and sometimes holy, and, and it's like we're not quite sure what to do with this. Let me suggest the concept of stay and remain to make it a little more tangible. Now, I'm gonna give you some illustrations of this, so I think it'll help you to see what is involved with that, and it'll appear less, uh, you know, spiritually vague. The word abide is a very important one to John. So notice on the books of the Bible, that's across the bottom, Matthew through Revelation, and then the bar chart shows the occurrences of the, book, of the word meno in each one of the books. And so you can see that one of them sticks up quite a bit here. Okay, any guesses on what that one might be? Okay, the Gospel of John. And then what do you suppose the guess would be over here? First John, yes. So this is a very important concept to John. It's important that we understand what he's talking about because he views it as obviously very critical, hits it numerous times. And so we want to understand this. So uh, I... Uh, enlisted uh, Dr. D Gary Derrickson's help on this to help us understand Abide. He talked about this earlier. It shows up in his books. Uh, he appreciated the fact that I used an earlier photo of him instead of updating it. <laughs> we were classmates at Dallas, so I can say that. Um, but his summary of this, I, I just haven't seen anything that, that uh, captures it like this, and so you've heard him talk about this, intentionally choose to build a relationship with Jesus by being influenced by what he says. All the parts are important. Intentionally choose to build a closer relationship with Jesus by being influenced, that's a key concept he emphasizes, by what he says. And so this idea of remain and stay is, is relational, and what Jesus is telling us is that it's, we have to intentionally build on it, uh, but the way it's taking place when it's happening is we're being influenced by what Jesus says. That's the concept of abiding. So I'm gonna proceed to illustrate this a little bit uh, for you as well. So here's the condition if you continue, if you abide in my word, in my word. Now, there are two different statements here, I've referenced them in verse 31, um, if you continue in my word, the truth will make you free. Here it's abiding in the word, and then when Jesus is talking later, he says, if this, and that's how you'll end up being free, if, you, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So it focuses on both Jesus and focuses on his word. And if you remember, I, I pointed that out with respect to believe. These people believed in him, as in the person, and they believed him in terms of what he said. And we see that, sh I think, showing up uh, on a regular basis. Okay, here's the main point. If, you've, if I've lost you, wake up for a second. Here's the main point. Freedom from the practice of sin comes from being influenced by Jesus and his word. Freedom from the practice of sin comes from being influenced by Jesus and his word. And most of you are saying, 
Well, that's not that profound. It isn't. The profoundness in it is if you do it. That's where the significance is. It's not that it's this uh, elaborate statement that uh, um, you've never heard before, but rather this is the, the key concept. Now, on that video, I'm going to grab a little Dr. Pepper here to keep me going because I'm getting dry. There we go. On that video, there were some serious sins. You start talking about alcohol and drugs, pornography and things that are addictive. This is serious stuff. And I don't think this verse is trying to treat it lightly and present like some simple catchphrase to say, here's what solves everything. I think what Jesus is doing is focusing in on the core of, of what's going to really matter for a believer. What is the most important thing if you deal with the practice of sin? What is the most important thing if you have a sense of being enslaved to some kind of sin? And there can be other things as, as well that come in and make a difference, but the most important thing is to abide with Jesus and his word. Now, you may, have, you may need the help of the church. You may need support groups. You may need uh, expertise from physicians and all kinds of things besides that. But the core thing, if you're a believer, is you've got to be abiding in Jesus' word. And that's what I think he's emphasizing. I don't think he's trying to make this oversimplified or ignore that some of this stuff is really challenging. So this passage, the truth shall set you free, has to do with, this is for believers, and believers are to abide in Jesus and his word, and by doing so, they have freedom. It is not by going to the University of Texas in Austin where the building says, and the truth shall set you free. A college education does not give you freedom, and it's far from free if you go there. I know this. I have two, I have two sons in college at the moment. It has to do with abiding. Now, uh, I want to picture this for you with the concept of stay or remain, stay or remain. Now, in this short video clip, there's going to be, there's going to be a fast walk, medium walk, and slow walk, okay? But what happens with this uh, uh, master and uh, boogie is the name, uh, it, I think pictures this whole concept of abiding, which is staying. Notice the staying and the remaining. Okay, here we go. do well? Okay, that's abide, that's remain. The master moves, what the dog do? Moves. Stops, the dog stops. I mean, he's got this down. Now, I know this is not biblical because we're sheep, not dogs, but I couldn't find a sheep that did this. <laughs> I couldn't find a sheep that abide and obeyed and anything like that. It's kind of like my wife and I go over to the rec center and they have classes for dog obedience, but they don't ever have cat obedience school, you know, and we have cats. Unfortunately, so um, but you you see this idea this dog is just walking. I mean right with the master just stop and go and it's and uh, The dog is just right there and happy as can be and I and when Jesus was talking to these people in that temple and he was Asking people to follow him and be disciples. I mean, I think he literally wanted them to go with him but of course he was only on earth for a short time and then with the Great Commission he did want people to keep making disciples. But they couldn't walk with Jesus in that sense. But you start going to the epistles and what you find is John is talking about abiding but Paul is talking about walking. And I think abiding and walking are the two things that capture what's going on. And so you've got this picture of abide 
you're looking to the master, you're staying close, you're remaining, you're staying close, and that's abiding. And then you're going to walk. Master says, let's go this way. You say, okay. Just head out. That sort of thing. And so for me, this may be a little, this is probably way too simplistic, but I like to figure out how to do things in a way that I can remember. I think of the spiritual life in terms of my responsibility as abiding and walking. Now, because I'm a believer, I have the Holy Spirit within me. I can respond to the Word of God. I can respond to Jesus. Uh, I now am in a place where I can live in a way that, that pleases Jesus. But I need to abide and walk. Abide and walk. And what you'll find is both those are commanded. Abiding is commanded. Walking is commanded repeatedly. Both instances. And so the abide and walk is like the little dog. Now, I want to make the picture much prettier, which is my wife right here. Uh, this is when we were hiking up near Taggart Lake near Jackson on our way to Lake Bradley, um, as some of you know. And we love to go hiking. And we also do it in terms of walking for exercise. So most days, my wife and I will walk two and a half miles. Now, we kind of do that for exercise, but what has happened is it turns out to be immensely helpful to our marriage. Now, to, to walk, we've got to have a conversation and agree, you know, we're starting here and we're going that way, and then we have to walk at the same pace that we do. I don't walk ahead of her or behind her. Uh, we walk, you know, alongside each other, and then we talk and we communicate, and we're abiding and we're walking. And when we do this every day, we're able to catch up on what's happened in, in, our, in our day. And when we miss a day, I'm afraid I'm at the age where it's like, well, honey, I can't tell you what happened yesterday. That was yesterday. <laughs> I can tell you what happened today, but not yesterday. And so what happens is that ends up being an important thing for our relationship. And I would suggest spiritually that's exactly the same situation. If we'll abide and walk with Jesus and respond and let his word and his, his life influence us and we adjust, then we're abiding and, and our relationship is built closer. Um, abiding is a analog thing. I'll use engineering terminology. It's not digital, it's analog. Digital is a toggle switch, on, off, on, off. Uh, analog is dimmer you know, bright or dim. And, and abiding, I think, is a, is a relational analog term in terms of, of uh, relationship. And when I am visiting with my wife, I am influenced by what she says, uh, and she is influenced by what I say, okay? Now, that may be because she makes a suggestion and I'm agreeable to it, or it's because we disagree with, some, with each other on something and we go a few rounds till we come to some kind of agreement. But we'll be influenced one way or the other with each other. Once again, the abiding concept, think of it relationally. With the Lord, abide and walk, and to be set free from the practice of sin, the core concept is that we abide in the word of God, in Jesus. At that time, when he says this to those people, he's probably referring to what he just said to them minutes earlier, But because the New Testament wasn't written. But then it expands because he's made the statement his words, so that's clearly gonna include his teaching when the New Testament is written. But then he gets to the statement, the truth shall set you free. Now he has made it a general statement of truth, and so that truth is going to be God's revelation. So he starts with where he's at, but he makes it into a statement that is, that is truth and is broad, and that's what we need to respond to. So we take, uh, we take a look at our, our uh, verses, our Bible, our scripture, whatever form it is in, and we look at a, a, look at a passage. Um, you might still use a written one, some of you, and we uh, have to respond to it and be influenced by it. And I think three things happen. I think we need to read the passage because it, we need to abide with the word of God. Then I think we reflect on it. This is where the Holy Spirit has the opportunity to, to call attention to something in scripture. Um, I, I used an illustration that he, he, he takes a highlighter out 
And when we are uh, reading a passage, he takes the highlighter and highlights his part and says, I want you to see that today. And you say, huh, I read that a whole bunch of times. Didn't see that till today. Well, the Holy Spirit just highlighted it. And then I think that he has us respond to the word of God, calls attention to things in our life. So it's a very living relationship situation. And then we respond. And if we are influenced and respond to what he has to say, then we are abiding. And that is the key to freedom from the practice of sin. That's the core issue. Staying close to Jesus, abiding with him, walking with him. So, let's say I look at John 1 uh, in my devotions. By the way, just a side note, maybe somebody can come up with a better answer. I can't find a verse that says, have a quiet time. I haven't found one. But this passage tells us to abide in his word. And that's actually a better statement because it could look different ways, different places, in different cultures, at different times. So it isn't one form. You've got to do this quiet time. It has three components. You can do this. this you know, it isn't that sort of thing. We abide in his, his word. And so we need to respond. And to the degree I let the word of God, Jesus Christ, influence my life and change it, that's the degree I'm abiding. And that's where growth comes. And that's where freedom comes from the practice of sin in our life. This is a great passage. One sentence. This is the one that Jesus says to these new believers that they need to know. Back to, I want to finish just with an illustration. I started it and, and got sidetracked. I'm reading in John 1, 14, because I was thinking of quiet time. Um, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten full of, uh, from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so, in terms of reading, I read that passage. Now let's say I reflect on this, and I say, uh, for the word became flesh, God became flesh, that sounds a little tricky, I'm not sure how that all works, and uh, dwelt among us, that was pretty cool, but he's not here now, and we beheld his glory. Well, those guys kind of saw it, I get to read about it, but it says he was full of grace and truth. Now that's an interesting concept. I maybe would have expected something else, maybe full of love, maybe full of truth, that would have been, but it says grace, full of grace and truth. What, what would Jesus say, what would God say if, if he was to describe what I'm full of? David is full of, well that could be bad after that. <laughs> okay, that could not be good maybe. Full of grace and truth. And I'm thinking, okay, if I'm walking with Jesus and I want to be like him and I want him to, to influence me, then perhaps I should be full of grace and truth. And I should be gracious, but no compromise with truth. I, I mean, we, especially here at GES, we're committed to truth. No compromise with that. No compromise. But did you notice it leads with grace? Grace and truth. So maybe I need to work on being gracious and truthful. Maybe not start with the argument, maybe start with the being gracious to somebody and interacting with them. Grace and truth. I don't think I meet the description that I'm full of grace and truth. But that's probably something I can work on today. Grace and truth. And so think about, as I interact with people, how am I going to respond with grace? That'll keep me busy for a while. But I don't leave off truth. We're not compromising the word. Uh, truth is, is what makes us free, is the truth. Great passage if we continue and abide in the words of Jesus, in God's revelation. We truly will be his followers or disciples and the truth of abiding in him and his word will give us freedom from the practice of sin as believers who have life and we can abide with him. And uh, that's just an exciting passage. The end.
didn't you and your wife have to first agree on a walking speed? <laughs> Was this difficult or easy? Actually, it's kind of a continuous negotiation. We get, if she's feeling energetic, she ends up walking ahead of me. And then on another day, if I'm feeling really energetic, I end up walking ahead of her. And it's like, hey, hold on a second. So it's, it's negotiated. <laughs> we don't have any speedometers to, to synchronize, so. Is there, this is a great question, is there any other known person who walked with God besides Enoch? Um, Noah walked with God? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I use the passage with Enoch to reinforce that the concept of walking is not just a New Testament concept. Uh, I don't have a good answer for this. Great question. Might abiding in Jesus' word be both analog and digital on off? I, I think that's fair. I think so, yeah. Because a person, I mean, I'm either, I'm either illustration-wise, I'm either walking with my wife or I'm not. <laughs> and then how well am I walking with my wife? So, so yeah, I think, I think that's a good way to think of it as being both digital and analog. How do other believers fit into this process of being set free? I think they're critical uh, because of other instructions. I think he's talking about the core of what needs to take place that uh, our issue in terms of freedom starts with the God of this universe that we have a relationship with and what he says and truth. And then other believers encourage one another um, we might challenge one another, confront one another, uh, do a whole variety of things, and I think that's all part of the process. That's why I emphasize that, you know, he's got one sentence here as, w as far as what was recorded. He didn't give us a big, long paper on how the mechanics all work out, and I think the rest of the New Testament show that believers are, are integral in the process, especially in some of these sins that tend to be addictive and really you know, the claws really go into our flesh. Those are, those are real tough ones. There was two comments from the lady over there saying that, um, pointing out that Adam and Eve walked with God. Ah, thank you. And this, this is from John. Oh yeah, great. Jo uh, Jesus walked with the two from Emmaus, even though they didn't know who he was. Uh, I, have, I have a question. Yeah. Is it significant that the truth doesn't cause us to abide, it's an influence. It's like propositional, something we, we understand and believe, and then it's up to our will to decide to put it into action. I think so. Uh, yeah, I need, to, I need to repeat it. The, um, uh, and see, in the New American Standard, it says the truth will make you free. The question is, is it significant that it doesn't say that the truth causes us to be free? Does that indicate that there's an issue of influence and response to it? Is that the question? Yeah, and I think you're, I think you're exactly right because the condition, if you continue, is a conditional thing that may or may not take place. And so a person may or may not respond to it. I, but I, I wanna pick up on the concept of truth being both the person of Jesus and his word. Now in this particular passage right here, in 32, you will know the truth. I think there he's talking about his word. And then when you get over to the other passage, when he's talking to the antagonist, it's him. And so it's not both on top of each other, but he talks about both. And so it ends up being both, so it's a response to a person. And that's also significant to me as I look at New Testament commands. I try to view them relationally, that this is something that Jesus is saying, hey, with this command, this is what I'd like you to do, to respond rightly to me. And, and I frame it relationally. So there's another card there. Aren't there three results of abiding in the word? Disciples know the truth, truth sets free. Um, 
Yeah, and I put a, uh, that's a good observation. They're getting tougher here. In verse 31, it says, if you continue my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Verse 32, this is what the question is keying off of, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And so the question is, aren't there three parts? Disciples, know the truth, truth sets free. If I was gonna make it three, I would say, believe in Jesus, know the truth, and truth set you free. I'd maybe itemize it that way. But I, I take this as, um, this truth is relational with the word no. This truth now is related and connected to me. It's relationally true in my experience. So I don't know if it's so much uh, a as a step as much as acquiring truth and connecting it to my life. So I, I don't think I'd, I, 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 we, we could put it as a, as a third result. That's, uh, I, I mean, in terms of abiding. I, I think that's uh, uh, probably a fine option. I, I don't see it as three just because I connected with the continue in my word. I, I see it back there, so. Okay, hope I have two here. Last two? <clears throat> yeah, with respect to these statements, whoever sins is a sin to is a slave to sin, the truth will set you free from slavery to sin. I am incapable of sinless living. Uh, do I know the truth? That's a great question. Um, I think this is the concept of, of analog again in terms of, of degrees. We, 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 our bodies are not free from sin uh, until we're glorified. So we're always gonna be wrestling with this. But the path of moving away from slavery to sin is abiding. And I think we can make progress, Jesus seemed to indicate that we could, so I don't think we end up with sinless perfection, but sometimes I think we cop out a little bit in terms of not taking advantage of the fact that Jesus has given us freedom if we will abide in him. Our problem, is, you know, we can't just put the card up and say, well, you know, I'm sinful. No, actually, you haven't been abiding. That's the problem. <laughs> Need to do some abiding, possibly. Great question. How do we abide in the word in the proper manner in light of uh, John 5.39? Can't uh, knowing the word be dangerous? Let me just make sure I get 5.39 right. So, um, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. I, I think if you emphasize that we're abiding in the word, it's abiding with Jesus and abiding in his word that solves that. Um, it is, doesn't stop with the scripture. If we stop it with just the words of the text as if it's just objective truth like a philosophy of life, and if I know this philosophy of life, it sets me free, I think we have to frame it relationally to Jesus who is our savior. And so I think there's... Uh, by keeping it focused on Jesus and what he says, I think we prevent that from, uh, from happening. Can't knowing the word be dangerous? If you don't know it well, perhaps, I think knowing it is a really helpful thing. So, so I'm maybe not following quite what the question is there. Anyway, thank you very much. Time is up.